Um, so I'm just going to now um, introduce Professor Martin Ola. Professor Ola is the Director of Gynecological Oncology at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. He's also a clinical professor in the discipline of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Adelaide and adjunct, <coughs> adjunct professor at the Futures Industry Institute of the University of South Australia. In addition to his very large public work, he also works in private practice at Burnside. Um, I know that because I refer to him all the time. <laughs> um, and he's going to speak to us about gynecological cancer in pregnancy. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, I think the best for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to talk about a bit about our work or about my work as gynecology oncologist. Uh, cancer in pregnancy in our area is they are the most difficult cases because you're not dealing only with one patient, you, have, you deal with two patients. You have the, the pregnant woman and also the unborn child. So they're some of the most difficult cases we're dealing with because you, deal, you, you treat two, two patients uh, the pregnant woman and also the unborn child, and the treatment of, of cancer is sometimes, in or many cases, incompatible with the, with the pregnancy, and then you are in the constant conflict and also have to take ethical, very difficult decisions. As we heard already, there are about this one, where one case of cancer in about 12,000 pregnant women. Uh, the numbers change, obviously, depending on which country you, you, you work. Uh, the incidence are always increasing worldwide, and uh, one reason is probably the, the increasing numbers of, of pregnancies in, in later in life, the delay of childbearing. Um, this is one, it's one of the main reasons, but it's not the only reason. Uh, looking at the type of cancers on the, on the pathology, um, the most common cancer in pregnancy is breast cancer. Uh, but it's immediately followed by cervical cancer, lymphoma and ovarian cancer. So the two of the most common cancer in, in pregnancy are gynecological. So I'm going to talk about cervical cancer and, and ovarian cancer. Uh, these are very multifaceted problems, the uh, uh, gynecologic cancer in pregnancy. And I'm only, only going to talk about the, the treatment uh, aspect, the surgery and chemotherapy, but obviously there's a lot of psychological issues involved and it requires a really a very complex multidisciplinary team to help these women and to, to, to treat their disease. Um, so our first is cervical cancer. Um, it's one of the most common cancer in pregnancies and occurs about one in 4,500 to 9,000 pregnancies. Again, depends a bit on the country. It's very, very common in third world countries. Numbers luckily are, are coming down in, in Australia or in more Western, Western countries because of, of the, the vaccination, uh, HPV vaccination. Luckily also, most cases are diagnosed as early stage. And that's the 70% are stage 1A. Uh, the reason is that, that a lot of women have pap smears early in pregnancy and then the disease is, is diagnosed. But we also know that pap smears in pregnancy are not very accurate. So there's blood and inflammation and if uh, the samples can be, can be false negative and, and, and uh, it's also because the cervix is difficult to see in pregnancy because of the pregnancy changes. But not only that, also microscopic, so full-blown cancers can be missed because sometimes symptoms are of cancer can be similar to physiological changes in pregnancy that can be discharged. There's increased vascularity, so there's a deserialization of the cervix and also it's also it's probably to take a biopsy. You don't, just don't want to take a biopsy in a very vascular cervix in a pregnancy. And that's the reason, so then the reason why 50% of cervical cancers are then diagnosed postpartum. And I've seen, seen a few of those cases and currently have one, one patient in, in private practice who just three months post, postpartum was diagnosed with a, with a four centimeter cervical cancer and at the normal delivery. Uh, but it was somewhat missed and not seen. Um, the main question, obviously, when you have a patient who's diagnosed with cervical cancer is what are you going to do? Are you going to continue with the pregnancy? Are you going to terminate the pregnancy? Have, do you have to treat immediately or can you delay the treatment? And, and then also what kind of therapy you're going to give to the patient? Uh -huh. And then there's also always the question of timing and route of delivery. And it's impossible for you as a gynecologist to, to take this decision alone. So you need a multidisciplinary team. You need to obviously need to the surgeon, but you also need an obstetrician, neonatologist, psychologist, and many other team members to ultimately do the right thing for the individual woman. And these decisions have to be highly individualized. There's no rule which fits everybody. 
Yeah, so you want also to want to treat this patient in a in a bigger center, and even if you treat the woman in big centers, no no center has really a lot of experience in, in, in treating this patient. I've been working in gynecology for twenty years and only have treated a handful of patients, so uh, the experience will always be limited. Uh -huh. Uh, treatment, treatment models for cervical cancer only in the very early stages can be really treated uh, with a local excision, with a cone biopsy. In pregnancy, you do a so-called coin biopsy, which is not as deep, but all other, other stages really requ require either radical surgery or radiotherapy, and this is not compatible with maintaining pregnancy. So um, one option would be to give neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which sometimes is an option to stabilize the disease, uh, to shrink the cancer. In non-pregnant women, this enables sometimes to, to excise the cancer in, in the pregnancy one again time. Um, looking at the literature, uh, women usually have a good outcome when you give neurative and chemotherapy, and it doesn't seem to have long-term effects on the, on the newborn. So, but I'm going to talk about chemotherapy a bit later. However, numbers are always limited. There's always a bit of potential reporting bias in, 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 in publications. Um, the factors which, which determine really how you're going to treat a cervical cancer in pregnancy is obviously the stage, how advanced is the cancer, then it's also the gestational age of the pregnancy, and ultimately probably the most, one of the most important factors is what do the parents want, and there are religious questions, cultural, ethical issues, and also the question of, of does a couple already have a child, and what's the reproductive history, that's all going to, going to impact the decision. Um, whether to treat immediately or to delay the treatment, there's no evidence that the pregnancy accelerates the course of cervical cancer. From that perspective, the pregnancy doesn't have an adverse impact on the, on the cancer itself. And there's also not much evidence that the delay of treatment of early cervical cancer, which means cancer confined to the cervix, has a negative impact on prognosis. Um, there are only the advanced cancers where immediate treatment is required. So definite treatment with term termination of pregnancy is usually Requirement when the cancer is spread, when the lymph nodes are involved, or when the cancer progresses in pregnancy, so when it becomes symptomatic, so when the woman develops severe bleeding, for example, that's an indication then to, to, to rescue, uh, rescue the, 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 the patients or the pregnant woman. Um, this is a, this is a Flow chart, treatment flow chart. No, it's very busy. Uh, it's been developed from the European Society of Medical Oncology with the, with the gynec gynecology oncologist. It's actually fairly straightforward. At the top, you can see the the, conf the cervical cancers confined to the cervix. The smaller ones, smaller than two centimeters, one B one, then the two to four centimeters, one B two, and the big ones, one one B three. And and what you can see is actually when you're beyond twenty two gestational weeks then you're usually able to maintain the pregnancy and postpone treatment and wait until the, the child is delivered. Or you can, when the disease is very bad, you give neurative and chemotherapy. Difficult is only the decision when the, the pregnancy is, is uh, less than 20 weeks. Then the guidelines of the European society say that you should sample the lymph nodes to determine whether the cancer is really confined to the cervix and hasn't spread yet. And depending on the lymph node status that they then treat, and in most cases, when the cancer is more advised to uh, more advanced, is then it advise the patient to have a termination. But obviously, this decision this has to be highly individualized and has to be discussed, discussed with the multidisciplinary team and also with the, with the parents. But in most cases, when the cancer is diagnosed beyond 20 weeks, you can maintain the pregnancy and uh, and treat after the the child has been been delivered. Um, if you have to terminate the pregnancy and cervical cancer with early stage disease, it's usually a radical hysterectomy with a fetus inside you and more advanced, then you, you treat the woman as you would, would, wouldn't be pregnant and do give a radical chemo radiotherapy with evacuation of the uterus or, or not. Uh, mode of delivery in cervical cancer. Um, the vaginal delivery should be avoided, avoided in cervical cancer because there's risk of significant bleeding. There might also be obstruction of the, of the birth canal. And metastatic implants have been reported up by episiotomy. It's not that rare, so something you should really avoid. So usually it's a cesarean section then with the radical hysterectomy for early disease or a cesarean section followed by chemo therapy for more advanced disease. 
outcome of cervical cancer in pregnancy, the majority of studies suggest there's no difference in the oncological outcome. So women who had cervical in pregnancy versus those who, who were not pregnant. And um, however, the outcome on the pregnancy itself obviously varies. There's a higher rate of spontaneous and prematurity or iatrogenic prematurity, as well as low birth weight infants um, that have been, been reported. So that's, that's a bit of an unknown. But the outcome for the, for the, for the pregnant woman herself is not different from, from a non-pregnant woman. So the next cancer I'm going to talk about is ovarian cancer. It's obviously a completely different disease. Uh, it's very, very rare, ovarian cancer. However, as we have heard before, is that adnexal mass are quite common in pregnancy. So the dilemma is always to decide or to, to establish whether the woman has an ovarian cancer or not. And only 1 to 3% of ovarian mass in pregnancy are malignant. The, the frequency of the different malignancies vary. Uh, the statistics I'm citing here, they show a higher, higher number of epithelial cancers. Other statistics show more germ cell tumors, more dysgeminomas, but ultimately it doesn't matter uh, because it's, you won't be able to decide uh, on, the, on the diagnosis based on statistic. <coughs> um, as a surgeon, you have to decide if you have to take out the you know, very mass or, or, or if you observe the mass. The indications for surgery for us to, to perform surgery is when the tumor is larger, when it persists in the second trimester, or when it has really highly suspicious features on ultrasound, as we've seen in the previous talk. Timing of surgery is always crucial. You want to delay the timing into the second trimester because by then the organ, organogenesis is complete. And the placenta replaces hormonal function of the corpus luteum. If you do it earlier, it's potentially gonna, gonna disrupt progesterone production. There's also a lower risk of pregnancy loss in the second trimester. And by this time, as you've also heard in the previous talk, is almost all functional cysts have disappeared. So you wanna do it in the second trimester. Again, this is a, the flow chart from, from Europe. Um, the colleagues there, the, you know, proposed to do laparoscopies. I'm actually not in favor of laparoscopies because when you don't know exactly what you're dealing with, uh, with an ovarian cyst, you don't, certainly don't want to do a rupture or any spillage. And it's very difficult to remove uh, ovarian masses uh, safely laparoscopically. So I prefer to do laparotomy and to establish the diagnosis. Uh, if it's a cancer confined to the ovary, that usually enables you to maintain, to progress with the pregnancy and then to treat after the child has been delivered. If the patient has a more advanced disease with peritoneal spread, then you're under pressure and most likely have to start with the chemotherapy uh, during the pregnancy. Um, indication for adjuvant surgery in uh, adjuvant chemotherapy and epithelial cancer are similar for pregnant and non-pregnant women. In early stage diseases, the more high risk uh, pathologies like grade two or three or stage one and C and two and all women with stage 3 with peritoneal disease need to have chemotherapy. Uh, standard chemotherapies, uh, whether the woman is pregnant or not, is caroplatin and paclitaxel. That's a standard treatment. Um, it is toxic, particularly in the first trimester, because it interferes with organogenesis and is associated with fetal death in a large number of cases and over 10% of, of newborns and have congenital mal malformations if you give it in the first trimester. So you really should avoid or have to avoid to give chemotherapy in the first trimester, which can be a big dilemma when the, when the woman has, is early in her pregnancy and is very sick. And ovarian cancer can have significant uh, um, uh, symptoms such as ascites or, or bowel, bowel issues like bowel obstruction, so where you can't avoid treatment. So, which then ultimately requires the termination of the pregnancy. Uh, from the second, second trimester, chemotherapy is fairly safe. It causes intrauterine growth uh, re restriction, uh, low birth weight, and still birth and prematurity have been reported, but in most cases, it, it can be given quite safely. Uh, timing of delivery of ovarian cancer is, is quite, quite important. Uh, so the mother shouldn't give birth within three weeks of the last chemotherapy because of myelin suppression, which is highest after three weeks. And the delivery shortly after chemotherapy should also be avoided because um, the placenta usually helps eliminating chemotherapies and uh, the, the newborn might not be able to, do, to metabolize the agents and it might lead to, to harmful toxicity. 
Uh, outcomes of ovarian cancer and pregnancy, more studies uh, show no difference in the oncological outcome of women with, uh, with ovarian cancer and pregnancy to comparison to non-pregnant women. And uh, the platinum-based chemotherapy, so <coughs> carboplatin, is associated with increased risk of small focal station age, and the Texans itself, Paclitaxel, is increased risk of admission to the neonatal intensive care unit. So, again, you want to want to manage his patients in the, in the tertiary center in an experienced uh, unit. A long-term follow-up of, of, of children born to women who receive carboplatin and paclitaxel uh, have, not, have not shown any, any adverse long-term effects like congenital abnormalities or haven't shown any delay in neurological development. So the so outcomes are quite, quite, quite good. So this brings me to the end of my talk. So very complex, difficult cases which have to be highly individualized and are really a challenge. Uh, but the outcome, if treated later in pregnancy, is usually favorable. Thank you.